The outcry over the murder of an unarmed black man believed to be completely innocent is intensifying throughout the country. Now, the deadly encounter happened in February, but this week, cell phone video has surfaced reportedly showing that the man shot three times while jogging in a predominantly white neighborhood. RT's Natasha Sweet has more on the fatal shooting, and we want to warn you, some of the video you're about to watch is a graphic. It's a sight no mother wants to see. I saw my son c come in the world and seeing him leave the world is it, it, not something that, that I want to see ever. Well, the authenticity of this video has not been verified by authorities. According to the attorney of Ahmad Arbery's family, this is him getting shot three times. Well, we see uh, clearly in that video that there were three shots, three shotgun blasts, which goes towards the mindset of the shooter, that his intent was to kill Ahmad Arbery. Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper, who has not watched the video, says her 25-year-old son was out exercising as he normally did. I do believe that Ahmad was just out for his daily job. Um, I have believed that since day one. Um, he's been doing this for, for years. The cell phone video initially posted by a Brunswick radio station shows a black man running on the left side of the road. A truck is parked ahead of him. The runner crosses the road, passing the pickup on the passenger side, then crosses back in front of the truck. Then the sound of gunfire ignites as the runner and man with the firearm are wrestling. After a second shot is made, the runner punches the man. Then a third shot is heard, and you can see the runner staggering before falling face down. According to a police report, the two men who reported shot Arbery, 64-year-old Gregory McMichael and his son, 34-year-old Travis, said they armed themselves after seeing a man running who fit the description of someone involved in a local robbery. According to the report, McMichael said his son fired two shots. Gregory McMichael recently retired as an investigator in the Brunswick District Attorney's Office. He also worked as a police officer for Glen County. No arrest or charges have been made, but now an outside prosecutor in charge of the case says he wants a grand jury to decide whether criminal charges are warranted. Something Arbery's family attorney says is a huge relief. We are all relieved that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as of last night uh, started an independent investigation. We are hopeful that that investigation will actually uh, do a lot more than the original investigation to uncover the truth and lead to the arrest of these men. But things won't move forward as fast as the Arbery family may want it to, as the coronavirus has left Georgia courts mostly closed until at least mid-June. For In Question, I'm Natasha Sweet, RT. And to talk more about this, I am joined by co-host of Watching the Hawks, Amisha Cross. Amisha, we've had some uh, new revelations in this case with you, were, uh, we were talking just moments ago, of TMZ releasing the police call as well. Absolutely. So just a couple of hours ago, TMZ actually publicly released the police call, the 911 call that was made by the father and son um, reporting the fact that they saw a black man running. And that's literally what they reported. Mm -hmm. They were asked from the dispatcher what the crime was, what was, uh, what was mysterious, things like that. They were asked three specific questions of which they never responded to any question. <laughs> And you can hear them talking about how they were going to chase him. You can hear them basically loading guns and driving off. So I think that there's a lot to be said there as well. First of all, they couldn't identify a specific crime. They couldn't identify why they were going after this man or why the call was even made to the police. Mm -hmm. Now, Amisha, this obviously has sparked anger from our various community, many coming out in protest, demanding justice for this 26-year-old man who was out for a jog. But they're also saying that this is nothing new. And again, as we were talking just before this, this happened in February. And, you know, at first you think, OK, this is coming out from an, the investigation. No, 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 this, this just started an investigation. Absolutely. So my biggest frustration here, and I think that of most civil rights advocates and leaders right now and his family, is that this incident happened on February the 25th. So the argument that the state has at this point is that they cannot call a grand jury because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. My argument and the argument that many attorneys have is that this started February the 25th. You didn't reach for a grand jury then. You didn't reach to call this an actual murder or what it was. You literally took the word of two men who had just murdered someone and came to the police and admitted what they did, that someone was dead. 
you can't have the word of the dead person and no one else was there. Mm -hmm. So you're listening solely to two murderers and you don't feel it necessary to lock these guys up. They're still, they have been walking free for the past three months. And there might be a reason to that. Uh, one of the things is uh, you had mentioned that there's been a shift as far as who is actually going to take over the case. We're now looking at what our third DA now? Three DAs. Um, two DAs had to recuse themselves because of their relationship with the father in question who fired the weapon. Mm -hmm. um, so just so that everyone knows, the father is someone who served in law enforcement for that county. This is another reason why this issue and why this case is going to be very sticky, because he has a relationship with law enforcement, a longstanding one, and he feels as though, you know, these are his friends. And we know in cases where police officers are chummy and they're friends with each other and you've been a part of that code of blue, it is very hard for them to see beyond that code. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that the men are arguing is that they are using Georgia's citizen's arrest law, which requires that the offender must have committed a crime in the presence of another person or that the person must have immediate knowledge of a crime that is taken place by the perpetrator. The father and son, again, like you had mentioned, the father having ties here. Uh, citizen's arrest law, is, you were you had mentioned a lot of these states have this law, but is that seen here? So the scary thing about citizens' arrest laws is that uh, in 35 states in this country, they exist on the books, which means that if someone is suspected of a crime, if you think someone committed a crime, um, you are allowed to go and commit a citizen's arrest against them. Thing here is that they called the police, police didn't tell them to go forward or do anything, didn't answer any of the questions from the police, and went out and did it on their own. You or I, or I think any sensical person, if you see something and you think that there's a problem, yes, you might call the police, but you're not gonna get in your car and chase them. In addition to that, they were demanding this man stop. If I am a black person, which clearly I am, mm -hmm. and there are two angry white men in a pickup in the South chasing me, Lord knows I'm going to haul tail. I'm not about to stop. We know that historically, time and time again, this is how lynchings occur. And that's exactly what happened on February 25th. And that they're actually calling cases like this, you know, the modern day lynching. And it also is reported too that there wasn't just one call made from the father and son that multiple people were calling saying that there's a black man in our neighborhood. I mean, down in the South, we know that there's roots of racism there and it still exists to this day. But I mean, this is pretty shocking that it's just a guy running and all these calls are made. Full disclosure, uh, my partner is with the ACLU of Georgia, so he is working very tirelessly on this case as well, and the NAACP is hosting a rally tomorrow. Um, one of the things that is extremely frustrating is that this neighborhood, the neighborhood that he was shot in, is very similar to white communities across the country where everyone looks like everybody else. So you're automatically thought of as a suspect or a criminal if you walk in with black skin. I want to be clear, the reason that this young man is dead is not because he was jogging, it's because he was jogging while black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this case plays out. Do you think that he will ever get justice for what happened? Absolutely not. I think that the clock continues to tick, time continues to go away, and we're seeing more and more people, sadly, even on social media, ask what he did to actually die. They are trying to piece together something that makes sense to them as a reasoning why and a fault a fault factor so that they can make the victims the guys who actually committed the crime. And I think that's what we see in these cases time and time again. I was hopeful that Trayvon Martin's murderer would actually get locked up. We saw that didn't happen. Another case of vigilante justice. I don't think it's going to happen here either. All right. Well, we appreciate your input, Amisha, and we'll be following this story and obviously coming back to you with more analysis on it. But co-host of uh, Watching the Hawks, Amisha Cross, thanks so much. Thank you.